Good morning. This morning we are going to continue our Bible study here in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 19. Uh, last time we were in chapter 18, and we were talking about uh, how David had just slayed Goliath. And after he slayed Goliath, Saul was supposed to give him his daughter uh, to be king, and he, he ends up kind of getting out of that one with one of his daughters. He eventually gives him Michael, his daughter, uh, which which is the second daughter, and says, hey, uh, you can have this one, his daughter, uh, but his his plan is for her to be a snare, in, a snare to him, and he's going to get him killed by going out to fight the Philistines. And um, so he requires him to go get 100 foreskins of the Philistines, David brings back 200. Uh, David marries Michael. Everything is good between David and Michael. Uh, but also, um, after David slayed Goliath, David and Saul's son, who was supposed to be the heir, and Jonathan become best friends. And they become very close, um, knit together. Uh, they love each other because they're both people after God's heart. They trust in the Lord. And so uh, Jonathan gives David his robe. And, and it's a signif- uh, significant because he he's saying, hey, you are going to be the heir. Like, I know you're going to be the heir. You're going to be the one that God raises up to be king next. And so Saul uh, doesn't like anything that's going on. He doesn't trust David. Um, Saul's filled with pride, whereas we talked about David and Jonathan and being filled with humility. Um, Saul's filled with this ego and this rage and all these different pieces, uh, whereas David and, and Jonathan are, are humbled before God and trying to walk in the way of the Lord. But God was with David. Uh, God delivered David from the hand of Saul numerous times as Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear um, when this distressing spirit came over him and David was supposed to be playing the harp. Saul tried to kill him. Saul was a mighty warrior, um, so it wouldn't be easy for Saul to kill him. I mean, it wouldn't be easy for David to escape, uh, but but he does. Why? Because the Lord was with him and the Lord had a plan. And so uh, we end up here at the end of this chapter after David and Michael had gotten married and uh, David's name was growing great in all of Israel. And so we pick up here in chapter 19 and it says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. And so now Saul says plainly, we're going to kill David. He's not even trying to hide it anymore. He's ready to take him out. He's ready to kill him. He wants him gone. He wants it to be over with. He doesn't want anything to do with David anymore. And so he makes it known to Jonathan and he makes it known to his servants Um, And Jonathan obviously was the wrong person to make it known to because Jonathan is one of David's biggest supporters. And so Jonathan told David, saying, My father seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. So Jonathan says, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to try to protect you. Uh, Go hide. Go, go take cover. It's going to be okay. I'm going to try and persuade my father and I'll let you know what happens. Thus, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without cause? And so Saul, or Jonathan is appealing to Saul here. He says, hey, what sin did David commit against you? He hasn't committed any sin against you, so why should you sin against David? Furthermore, David took out your problem in Goliath when all of the Israelites were hiding in rocks and and terrified of what was going on. He struck down Goliath even though it could have cost him his life. Why are you trying to take out David? Why are you trying to slay innocent blood? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all the things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as in the times past. I'm in his presence as time passed, probably as the harp player again, um, in the presence of Saul amongst the distressing spirit. But Saul makes this promise that he will not kill David. He's done trying to kill David. He's going to be okay. So verse 9, it goes on to say, Now the distressing spirit from the Lord, or sorry, I skipped verse 8. Verse 8 says, There was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. 
And so now David goes back out to battle. Um, David is a warrior. And when David goes to battle, the Lord is with David. Because David trusts in the Lord. And David knows that the battle doesn't belong to David, but the battle belongs to the Lord. And so David trusts in God. God brings about a victory yet again, but that makes Saul all the more frustrated. Why? Because David is earning favor in the sight of people. Whether the people realize that God is with David or not, um, I'm sure some do and some don't, and some are praising David and some are praising the Lord. Whatever it is, he's gaining favor in the sight of all the people because he's slaying the Philistines who are their enemy. And if people think that God is with him and, and that's how it's happening, the people are excited to be with David because God is with David. If the people think that it's David that's doing the slaying and not, not necessarily God, the people are excited to be with David because he's a warrior able to take down the Philistines who doesn't cower and hide in fear like Saul does. And so David is growing very, very popular and that's making Saul all the more uncomfortable, all the more uneasy, um, all the more you know frustrated towards David as this thing goes on. Again, filled with pride, Saul is filled with pride, and he doesn't want anyone else to get the glory. And so verse 9, it says, Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in the house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. Again, what an opportune time for the distressing spirit to come on Saul when he's already frustrated that David had just won another victory. Uh, but he's sitting there play, while David's playing music. Saul's got the spear in his hand. And, and you can imagine what's going to happen next. Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, just like he did in the last chapter two different times. But he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. God again is with David. And if God is with us, we don't have to be afraid. If God goes before us, if God has a plan, if God has made a promise, it's going to come to pass. And what God had promised David is that you will be the next king of Israel. God had anointed him. God is raising up David to be the king of Israel. So nothing is going to happen to David. David just needs to trust in the Lord. David needs to walk in the way of the Lord and know that the Lord is good and the Lord is working in this situation for his glory and his honor. And we see David escape three times from the hand of Saul, who has a spear, who's ready to pin David to the wall, this trained warrior in Saul. And yet only by the hand of God could David escape. The Lord is with David. And he helps deliver David from this place. And for us today, as I read about this and think about the promises of God, we can trust the promises of God. God never fails. God is always faithful. Um, it was a few weeks ago that we were talking about missions. And uh, th that scripture in Genesis 12 is, is such an important scripture. Um, that's why I, I talk about it so often when I preach or when I do Bible study. Uh, because it really, it starts the mission of God throughout the entire Bible. Um, and, and that is that he wanted the people of Israel to be this, this witness for him. He wanted them to be this light that shines in the darkness, that shines in the community. He wanted to bless nations through, the Lord, through, through his people Israel. He wanted all the nations to be blessed. How are they blessed? The only way that they are blessed is to know who God is and to surrender their lives to him. That is the most blessed that they can ever possibly be. But Israel fails. For Israel to succeed, Israel needed to walk in the ways of the Lord. They needed not to follow idols like everyone else, but to walk in God's way. And so Israel failed in the mission. And while God reaffirmed that, that mission over and over again, perhaps even to Moses and some others, he, he said, if you follow my commands and you do not walk into idols, then I will bless you and you will be a blessing to these nations. These, are, these other nations are going to see who I am by your obedience, by your walking in my way, and it's all going to work out. But Israel is not faithful. And Israel does not keep the way of God. Instead, Israel sins against God and messes up time and time again. God delivers them into the hand of their enemies and they're brought into exile and into captivity. But ultimately, even though Israel is faithless, God remains faithful. And God is faithful in that he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to come onto this earth, to suffer, to bleed, and to die, to make a way that all people of all nations may know who Jesus is and have life in a relationship with him. God's promises never fail. People are faithless. People mess up. People make mistakes. People do not walk in the way of, the God, way of God in the way that they should. Do not put God first in the way that we should. 
but yet God remains faithful even though people are faithless. And so whatever God's promises are, uh, here in the Word of God, read the Word of God. See what God has to say. God's promises never fail. And you can count on them. You can trust in them. You can know they're going to happen. Just as God is protecting David, who he's promised to be the king of Israel. So God is protecting So God is carrying out the promises that he's promised to you and to me and to all people here in his word for his kingdom and his glory and his honor. And so verse 11, after David had escaped from the spear of Saul, it says, Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not leave or if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. And so David um, is in a good position in this house in the sense that he's got Jonathan as an ally who advocated for him on behalf of his father and was able to stave off Saul for at least a short period of time. And now he has Michael, who is also on his side, uh, who is able to hear the thing of the king's house and to bring information to David to save him alive. Whereas Saul intended Michael to be a snare to David. Michael is actually a blessing who is going to be a product of saving David's life. He's going to be used to save David's life. I think it's interesting, though, that Saul sends his messengers to kill David. I guess he thinks, you know, he hasn't had good enough success or good enough luck, so he's going to send some messengers to take David down. Perhaps they will have better success and better luck in the midst of it. And so he sends his messengers down. Michael warns David. So Michael let David down through the window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a cover of goat's hair over it, for his hair, for his head, and covered it with clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to David, she said, he is sick. He goes to try to get messengers. He sends them down to try to get that taken care of. And yet he's sick. They say, oh, he's sick. Not really sick. Sent him off to, uh, sent him off to be saved. And so Michael's covering this up. She puts this goat hair down. Um, you've probably seen something like this in a TV show before. I mean, this is like, this is, this is as old as well, however old long ago David was, and perhaps even longer than this. Um, I don't know that Michael was necessarily the first one to think up putting a, a head of, with hair on it, but maybe um, to, to cover this up. But she does this. She puts this down, a fake David in bed and says he's sick. That's why he's not getting up. So then Saul sent messengers back to see David saying, bring him to me in the bed that I may kill him. Saul's like, oh good, he's sick. He's immobile. He can't do these things. I'll take care of this. I'll take him down. I'll strike him dead. It'll be over with. And so she's, he's prepared now that David is immobile, that David is unable to fight back. He says, oh, I could do this. Really, Saul has no, no strength, no ability. He has no trust in God. He, he wants the easiest way out. He doesn't want to fight David like a warrior. He wants to slay David in his weakest state. And that says a lot about, David, or about Saul's character, that if David is sick, then Saul will try to kill him. If not, he's going to send his messengers to do it because Saul is fearful of David. And that's David may indeed strike him and kill him because he knows God is on his side. And one thing that Saul can do well is fear God. Um, and we see that throughout the Bible, even whenever Saul was rejected as king, he feared the Lord that out being on his side and perhaps for selfish gain, uh, but also perhaps because he knows the power of the Lord and who God is. But he says, bring him to me. I'm going to kill him. If he's sick, he won't be able to do anything. And so verse 16 said, when the messengers had come in, there was an image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. And Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he escaped? And Michael answered Saul, he said, let me go. Why should I, ki- why should I kill you? And so um, Saul is mad that his daughter let David go. Uh, but they're married. They have a good marriage. I don't know how Saul is so blind to see that Michael and David have this love for each other, that they care about each other. Uh, and, and he didn't see it. And now he's frustrated that his daughter betrayed him and, and was not letting David be killed in this moment. And so she makes up this excuse And and we get a little bit more information about what ends up happening with David. So it says, David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah, which is the place of Samuel, where Samuel lives, where uh, Saul and his his person went up, his servant went up when they were looking for the the missing animals, the missing donkeys, uh, back when Saul anointed was, was anointed king by Samuel. They went up to Ramah. That's where Samuel dwells. And so he goes up to, to Ramah and he told him all that Saul had done to him. 
And he said to Samuel, he, uh, he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. Now it was told, saying, Take note, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the group of prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul. And they s prophesied. And when Saul went, he sent messengers, and the others prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers again a third time, and they prophesied also. So what's going on here is that David has escaped. Um, Michael had told them what was going to happen. God had more or less used Michael for his glory to protect King, uh, the future King David here. And David runs away and he goes to Samuel. Uh, Samuel is the one that anointed King David, is, or the, David to be king over Israel, to be the one who is going uh, to 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 go after Saul is no longer king. And so he goes to Samuel because he says, "I could trust Samuel." He goes up to Samuel to be with Samuel. And while he's with Samuel, Saul hears that he's gone up to Ramah. And so he sends his messengers to go up and to kill David. Again, Saul doesn't go himself because he's fearful of David. He's fearful of David's power. He's fearful of David's, uh, uh, that God is with David and that he's actually a pretty good warrior now because God is with him. Whether Saul acknowledges God's power in David or not, I don't know. But I do know he's fearful of David. So he sends messengers because he's afraid. And what ends up happening is that when the messengers get up here to try to kill David, God puts his spirit on them and they begin to prophesy. God turns to them and makes them prophesy rather than hurting David. He stops and protects David. And this happens three times. God's hand is on David. He will not let anyone stretch out their hand against him because he is going to be the king. God has made the promise. You can put it down. You can write it in ink. It's going to happen. There's going to be nothing that's going to stop this from taking place. God is going to make David become the king of Israel. God said it. God is faithful. God's promises are true. It doesn't matter how hard Saul tries. It doesn't matter if Saul joins with the army of the Philistines and they all go after David. God is going to protect David because God has made a covenant and God has made a promise and God always comes through. And so God protects David from these, prof or from these uh, messengers of Saul. And so verse 22, it says, Also, uh, then he also went to Ramah and came to that great well that is at Seku. So he asked and said, Where are Saul, Samuel and David? And some, uh, some said, Indeed, they are in Naoth and Ramah. And so now Saul himself has finally decided to show up and look for David. And he's going to try to kill him himself. He's like, What is going on? Why are my messengers not succeeding? I don't understand. So he went there to Naoth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. Now Saul receives the Spirit of God yet again for the final time, only in this moment. Why? Because God put the Spirit upon him. Not because Saul was worthy of the Spirit, but just as these messengers had come, God protected David by putting the Spirit of God upon Saul in order to prophesy for God's glory in the midst of it, at this place in Ramah. But what happens next? It says he stripped his clothes off and prophesied before Samuel in the like manner and lay down naked all the day and all the night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? This echoes back to what happened when Samuel, or uh, when Saul became king. Uh, we saw that. Um, I even talked about it in a sermon. But the Holy Spirit came upon Saul and he became a new man. He became a different person. He was changed by the power of the Spirit of God. What ends up happening is he rejects God, he rejects the Spirit, and God ends up sending a distressing Spirit upon him later, and he no longer has the Spirit of God. Uh, but this is what this echoes, is that Saul at one point was among the prophets. People were like, is he among the prophets? Because the Holy Spirit changed him. And he does so here again as well. The Holy Spirit changes Saul in this moment for God's glory and to protect David. But in the midst of his prophesying and in the midst of what was going on here, Saul is stripped of his clothes and he's prophesying naked face down on the ground. What does that mean exactly? Why did this happen? 
Yeah, it happened because we're protecting David. God was protecting David, and that was God's plan. Uh, it happened because God can use even bad vessels for his glory, and God is getting glory in the midst of what's happening with Saul here. Uh, but the other piece to note is that Saul has been stripped of his clothes. These aren't any clothes. These are royal clothes. They signify his kingship, and he has now been stripped of his clothes. Why? Because God has stripped him from being king. He is no longer going to be king. This is a very humble position for Saul to be in. He, not only is he not wearing his royal clothes, his royal robes, uh, what it would look like to be king, but he is naked and he is bowing down on the ground, which is not something you would expect from Saul when you read the scriptures after he rejected God as king, uh, but also not something you would expect from a king. This is a very vulnerable, humble position. My commentary says, Saul removed his armor and his royal garments prompted by the Spirit of God, signifying God's rejection of Saul as king. Without royal garments, Saul was figuratively naked, perhaps so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God as to be in deep sleep. Other than Saul's utter despair and pitiful state at home, uh, at the home of the witch of Endor, and his end at Mount Gaboa, this episode represents one of the most severest humblings in Saul's life. This humbles Saul. And when we talk about the word of God, uh, we often talked about how God says, I will humble those who exalt themselves, and those who exalt themselves I will humble. Or, sorry, he, he says, if you, if you humble yourself, I will exalt you, and if you exalt yourself, I will humble you. I think I said the same thing on accident two different ways there. That was weird. Uh, but... Saul has exalted himself, and if you've been following along in this Bible study the last several weeks, you've seen how much pride Saul has had. And pride always comes before the fall. And here God humbles Saul in the ultimate way here, as he, he not only strips him of his royal robe, signifying that he's rel rel relinquished him from his kingly duties, like he's, he's been rejected as God's king over Israel, but he also humbles him by putting him naked and face down in this humble state before Samuel, who no longer wants anything to do with Saul, who's seen God reject him as king and is no longer with him, and, and, and before David, his enemy, who he wants to kill. He's in this vulnerable position taken over by the Spirit of God for God's glory as God fully humbles Saul. And so for us here, um, just as we, we finish up this chapter, it's important for us to remember that we are called to be people of humility. Uh, that we don't, we don't live this life for ourselves, that we don't build up treasure on this earth for ourselves, that we don't make everything all about us, that we're not like Saul, that everything has to revolve around us, that everything has to go according to our plan, that everything needs to be about us. That's what Saul was. He was a very prideful person. He was all about himself. He was all about his mission, but not the mission of God. You and I are called to be about the way of God, the truth of God, the mission of God. Even if it's an inconvenience for what we think is our life, we exist as vessels of God for God's glory. As long as we have breath in our lungs, we are called to be good stewards of our lives, to live them out accordingly for God's glory. Not for our comfort, not for our enjoyment, not for our entertainment. That's what this country is all about, I know. I know we love our entertainment, we love our enjoyment, we love all that good stuff, but we are not here for that purpose. We are here to glorify God and to bring praise and honor and glory to His name. And if we are people filled with pride, we're never going to live that up. We're never going to live that out. We're going to be way too prideful to ever bring about, bring ourselves into a position where we might be vulnerable in sharing the good news of the gospel where someone might reject us. But when we humble ourselves the way that God wants us to, and we make our lives all about Jesus, that's when we live our lives out for God's glory. That's when we see and meet the needs of people. That's when we see people and want to show them the love of Jesus because God is the most important thing in our lives and that, that, that they're ever going to meet, that they're ever going to know. That's, the, that's when we, we share Jesus with them because we want them to find their identity in Jesus and not in the rejection that they're feeling in their life. We want them to meet the king of the universe. Our lives have purpose and our lives have meaning. And the purpose of our lives and our meaning isn't for us to live for ourselves, but it's to live for the glory of God. But for that to happen, we need to humble ourselves and to submit to the authority of God, the obedience of, that God calls us to live in, and into the Holy Spirit of God that we will live out our lives in this mission for God's glory and honor. That's 1 Samuel chapter 19. Uh, we're going to go ahead and look at 1 Samuel chapter 20 next time if you want to look ahead. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and close out in prayer. 
Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love in our life. Uh, Lord, we're not worthy, uh, God, to even be in your presence. We're not worthy to even come before you. But Jesus, you are good and you are faithful and you are righteous. And we thank you today, Jesus, for that goodness and that faithfulness and that righteousness that you care for us, that you care about us, that you walk alongside us, Jesus. I thank you today, Father, that you know me, uh, Lord, and you still love me. God, you know every one of us, you know the depths of our heart, and you love us the same, Jesus. We pray that you forgive us for our lack of obedience, Jesus, for our lack of faithfulness to you. And Lord, we praise you today that you are still faithful even when we're faithless. God, that you are still good, that your promises endure, that they never fail. Jesus, we pray that you forgive us for, for our pride. Lord, we want to be people that are humble, that are driven by your spirit to live a life for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your honor. Lord, we pray that you would open up windows and doors of opportunities for us to step through. And you would give us the boldness and the audacity to step through it for your kingdom and for your glory and for your honor. Realizing that this life is not about us, but it's all about you. And Lord, we thank you for hearing us today. We thank you for loving us. And we pray to you be the glory in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next time to do 1 Samuel chapter 20.